Thank you, George. Turn to Romans chapter 9. Tomorrow evening, we, uh, we'll only have one session, our regular 8 to 9 class. After that, I have a wedding to perform. And it's supposed to be a secret, so I can't tell you who it is. But anyway... Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, I want to begin with this evening, but again, before we do, we'll take a moment of silent prayer to give us the opportunity to enter into fellowship with God, which of course means naming and citing any known sins if we have any, and also if there's something troubling you, now is not the time to concentrate on your problems, but now is the time to give your undivided attention to the Word of God as it is being spoken. So with that in mind, let us pray.
Thank you, Father, again for the privilege we have to gather together in this nation to study your word, to have the gospel taught, to be able to have the freedom to teach and learn Bible doctrine. We also pray for members of our local assembly and those throughout the country and throughout the world at this particular time when there's a lot of sicknesses, diseases, flus, and things that are going around to try to hinder them and hinder us from going forward, make us weary. So we do have people that we're all thinking about right now that we are praying for in the physical realm. But most of all, Father, we pray that they would be motivated in the mental realm to fulfill the spiritual life. So we ask your blessing to be upon these principles this evening. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Well, once again, in the Word of God, there always seems to be what we call contradictions. But they're not really contradictions, they're really seeming contradictions. Such as you have the fact that many people think that they're in the light, but they're really in the darkness. Other people think that they're in the darkness, but they're really in the light. You have individuals who think that prosperity is what really makes them strong and proves that they are successful, when in reality, it's adversity. And so throughout the Word of God, you see certain principles that are not the way that humans think. And if you were not here last evening, I mentioned one of them, which is the fact that uh, many individuals today don't grow when it comes to that right man, right woman relationship because it's not an individual that you're compatible with because of your tastes and your desires, but it is an individual that actually draws you closer to God that causes you to need the spiritual life. They cause you to have to learn and master the problem-solving devices. They cause you to get closer and you cause them to get closer as well. So if you're looking for that perfect individual, trust me, it does not exist. No one is perfect, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we cannot look at things from the natural realm, we have to look at them from the spiritual realm. And by the way, this is one of the things Paul has proven to us in verses uh, 6 through 7 of Romans chapter 9. He's talking about the Jews, but then he says all the Jews are not Jews. All Israel are not real Israel. For example, Abraham had eight sons. He had eight sons. And only one of them was an individual who had believed in the Lord. And that's why Genesis 25, 2 says that Abraham left everything he had to Isaac. Things are not always what they seem. So Paul makes a statement similar to this principle when he says in verse 6, However, this rejection, Romans 9, 6, for those of you who have just come in, this rejection, the Jews' rejection concerning their spiritual heritage, is not to imply as though the word of God has failed. God will fulfill his word to the Jews, but they have to be true Jews. God will fulfill his word to Israel, but they have to be true Israel. So he says that this is not to imply that the word of God has failed simply because many Jews have rejected Christ. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac it says your descendants will be named. Why? Because Isaac was the only individual, the first individual, by the way, who was a true Jew after Abraham, because Isaac was an individual who had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you were not here last evening, I'd strongly recommend you pick up that teaching where we began to note some new things on how to look at the Word of God in a different perspective. Now go back to Romans chapter 5. One of these same principles, and probably one of the greatest principles in the Word of God, is the fact that God takes uh, that individual that's going through, uh, that has been condemned, and qualifies that individual for salvation. That in reality, condemnation at birth, God imputing, uh, imputing Adam's original sin to us at birth, was a, a, a tremendous, tremendous blessing. Much better than if we were born without sin doesn't make sense to the natural mind, but if you have an open heart, you'll find out that all these things are true. So we began to look at what Paul was telling the uh, Jews and the Gentiles about in Romans 9. We began to look at God's plan for the human race, 
which, by the way, reveals the eternal and infinite genius of God. We started out, for example, with the creation of the man and the woman. God's plan is the fact that he created man and woman. He created both of them perfect. And uh, human life is imputed to us at physical birth. That's the first imputation. And then we also noted that at the same time that God gave us human life, he also did something else. He, we received a second imputation. And that second imputation came from the justice of God and the righteousness of God. It was Adam's original sin, not ours, but Adam's original sin was imputed to us, which qualified us for a savior. We were instantly condemned before we ever made a, a one, dis, one decision. We were instantly condemned before we even cried as a child. The moment of birth, God actually imputed to us one man's sin. And there's nothing better, by the way, for mankind than instant condemnation from God. Uh, condemnation comes from people, there's nothing worse. But if it comes from God, it is from His grace, from His mercy, and from His genius. And so beginning with Romans 5, verse 12, I want to point out that the genius of God actually dealt with the fall of man in a tremendous way that qualified man to be the recipients of grace and mercy. And when, uh, when God created mankind and Adam sinned, not the woman, it's when Adam sinned that the man passes down that sin nature. Instant condemnation, it resulted in mankind totally depraved, totally helpless, and having to need a savior, having to need God. And so God solved the problem with the human race. He solved mankind's problem with the justice and righteousness of God. He did something for us in grace that was much greater than he did for Adam and the woman in the environment of perfection. So look at verse 12. Paul, again, we'll just uh, quickly review this before we go on in our passage. It says, therefore, Paul says, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. Not sins, but sin, really the sin nature. And then death came through that sin. And by the way, that's spiritual death. Death came through that sin. Spiritual death results in physical death. And so death, because of that, one's man's, that one man's sin, spread to all men, because all sinned when Adam sinned. Now notice in verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world. This is talking about the commandments and the Mosaic law. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. In other words, the sin nature disturbed our relationship uh, with God to the extent that, uh, that it's now crystal clear to members of the human race. God said, listen, you are now going to be condemned because of one man's sin, and you're now going to need some help because there's nothing you can ever do to earn your salvation nor keep your salvation. And so God actually, when it says sin until the, uh, law, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin's not imputed where there is no law. So God actually did something. He made it crystal clear. He spelled it out in detail what his justice and righteousness required. And he did that through the Mosaic law. And you see individuals mistake that. They think that if they follow that, there's some type of blessing. And that's why he writes in verse 14, nevertheless, death, this huge separation from God, by the way, which dominated mankind's problems with God, nevertheless, death, even though there's no law, there was no rules or commands to follow, death reigned from Adam until Moses even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. In other words, even those who did not sin like Adam did. How? By disobeying one specific command, God actually did something to Adam that he does not do to any one of us. He never ever separates us again from himself. And so God gave a specific command and Adam ended up uh, coming with the principle of obeying the woman or getting it from the woman, whoever it was. He entered into that death, that separation from God. And please notice that Adam, who got us into this, is said to be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of 14, it says that uh, Adam, who is a type of him who was to come, he is said to be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ because he also points ahead to the one who would get us free. 
Adam tells us that there's someone coming. He's called the last Adam. There's only two Adams in the Bible, the first Adam. The first Adam got us in a jam. The last Adam gets us out of it. And that's why he puts it like this in verse 15. But the free gift, the free gift of salvation, is not like or exactly the same as the transgression. For if by the transgression of one the many died, now notice the a fortiori here, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So Paul is actually using what we call an a fortiori, that much more principle. He's saying this, if one man's sin put all mankind into the dead end abyss of separation from God, just think of what God's gift poured out, poured, uh, uh, poured of salvation through one man. God's gift actually was poured out. And he gave salvation through one man, Jesus Christ. Just think of what that will do. In other words, you cannot compare Adam with the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. Now, if Adam's sin could cause the entire human race to be condemned, think of what the Lord Jesus Christ and his decision and his sentence on the cross, by the way, can do for mankind who receives that gift. So that's what he's saying. Please notice Adam got us into this. He's said to be a type of the Lord, and he also points to the one who would get us out of this, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he puts it like this. But the free gift, salvation, is not like or exactly the same of, 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 uh, as the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many, more, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And then he actually tells us something interesting. He's saying there's no comparison between death and sin, the death and sin that was brought on with, by Adam, the first member of the human race who was the head. There's no comparison compared to God's gracious and generous life-given spirit and life-given individual, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't compare the two. But who's better off? Adam, who was born in perfection, in an environment that was totally perfect, and God brought one woman, God created one woman, that was his woman designed by God, and God, he had perfect happiness at that time. Or who's better off, him or us? Of course, the issue is we are, because we're instantly condemned, and that automatically qualifies us to need a savior. So he says, the gift is not like that which came through the one man. You see, the verdict on the one sin, the one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was the wonderful life sentence uh, called eternal life. So one man was sentenced to death. The other man died for our, uh, in our place so that we could be sentenced to eternal life. So look at verse uh, 16 again. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, Adam. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, one transgression resulting in condemnation to all. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, your sins and my sins, the sins of the world, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through that one, notice again, much more those who receive, there's a reception, there has to be a free will decision, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He's saying again, if death dominate us, dominated us and controlled us through one man's sin, think of it, much more can you imagine the breathtaking gift from God through his son, the last Adam, who has given us sovereign life. He actually came up with the plan and God said, you now have something Adam and the woman did not have in the garden. What were they lacking? They were lacking eternal life. They had a beginning and they had everlasting life, but they did not have the life that we had, have right now until after they sinned. They sinned. You see, God's word and God's ways are way beyond our ways. We always tend to think that because we're doctrinal believers, we've been born again and heard the word of God for maybe a decade or two or three, that that makes us understand what the word of God has to say completely. No, every day you will grow. And that's why you'll see as the, uh, as the pastors, myself included, as we grow in God's word, you're going to find out that you're going to see things from a different perspective. And it doesn't mean that what we taught in the past was wrong. It just simply means that what we taught in the past was incomplete. 
because we're going to keep on doing this according to John 1.12 when we get to the eternal state. So the, when it says much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, this simply means that those of us, those who actually grasp, they grasp that eternal life, the extravagant gift of life from God, they will reign in this life. They can be winners in this life and, uh, that one, and they get that gift from one man, Jesus Christ. He provided that like Adam provided our sin nature. Jesus Christ provides us with this eternal life. And, that's, and here it is in a nutshell, by the way, verse 18. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. It sounds like Paul's repeating, but he's not. He just knows how thick our skulls are and how we need, keep on needing to hear the same things from different points of view. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all man, men, even so through one act of righteousness. Notice, one transgression, one act of righteousness, there, re, there resulted justification of life to all men. All men are justified because Christ has died for their sins, but they have to be willing to make that free will decision to believe on him and trust him for that justification. So he's saying just as one person did, did wrong and got us all in a jam, another person did it all right and got us not only out of that jam, but gave us something even more than what mankind had in a state of perfection. And he got us, he didn't just get us out of trouble, the Lord Jesus Christ. He actually got us into a greater life. And, one, and that's why Satan was shocked. That's why Satan hates, uh, hated the cross, because he knows that God always has a plan that outsmarts his creatures. And the sooner we learn that, the better off we're going to be. Verse 19, as through one man's disobedience, the many, hoi polloi, the entire human race, were made sinners because of one man's sin, even so through the obedience of the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. The first Adam said no to God, and many people, and got every member of the human race in death, and, and got us to be totally separated from God. The last Adam, in 1 Corinthians 15, 40, to 42, uh, 40 verses 42, 42, the Lord Jesus Christ is called that last Adam. So we only have two Adams, the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam was the head of the uh, creation of mankind. The last Adam is now the head of the spiritual foundation, the new creature, the church, Israel, and all those Gentiles that live throughout the uh, Old Testament as well. And so I love what he says right here. The law came in, not so that mankind could follow it and be puffed up about the fact that he's a little bit holier and better than others. No, the law came in that the transgression might increase. And all of us know that. That's why you can't repent from your sins to be saved because of the fact that you don't even know what sin is until after you're saved. And so he's saying when the law came in, that was God saying, okay, I'll let you know more of what I demand of you. I'll let you know more of what you have to do. I'm going to, uh, going to give you a set of rules, not for you to follow to please me, but a set of rules to show you how bad you are. And that's instant condemnation, by the way. And what does that do? Qualifies us for salvation. So the Lord came in, the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, you see, grace is much stronger than sin. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So all, those, all that the law did was to tell us that we're worse sinners than what we thought. It was not to cause mankind to get on a religious program. Sin doesn't have a chance, by the way, when it tries to compete with the grace of God. And that's why you have a choice. Either put yourself under the sin nature, because the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin or the sin nature is trying to put you under rules and laws and, and condemnation to make you feel not worthy. But the grace of God always is much stronger than what sin could do. Why? Grace came from the last Adam. Uh, the sin nature came from the first. And uh, when, it's, when it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. So verse 21 says that as sin reigned in death, even so grace, notice again, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. All sin, all sin can do is to threaten us with death, and that's the end of it. 
And that's why Satan loves to see individuals being put under the law. Grace rules, he's saying in verse 21 of Romans 5. It rules if we allow it to rule in our life. We still have to make that free will decision. And you see, because of all this, you and I don't have a leg to stand on. None of us do. We have a lot of people roaming around, running around, thinking that they're pleasing God and that they're righteous and the greatest sinner who ever lived. We're going to look at it in just a second. He was the greatest sinner who ever lived because he was the person that had more self-righteousness and more legalism than on any other member of the human race. He thought he was in the light when he was really in the darkness. So because of all this, we don't have a chance when it comes to working for something, even blessing. We don't have a chance even to be arrogant about what we have or have not done. The issue is not your personal sins or mine. That has been taken care of. The issue is the fact that a man called Adam uh, passed down the sin nature, and then a man called the Lord Jesus Christ took care of the problem Adam gave us. We didn't deserve the first one. We don't deserve the second one. We didn't deserve condemnation. We did not commit one sin. We don't deserve perfect righteousness. We were never perfectly righteous unless we believe in the plan that God has designed. So none of us have a right to go around thinking that you've committed uh, so many sins and that means you're not spiritual. Uh, you have the imputation of human life at birth and you have the imputation of Adam's original sin at the same time. But now the issue is not your first birth. The issue is your second birth. Your second birth is when God gives you, imputes to you, eternal life as well as divine righteousness. So Adam's sin, when we recognize it, we have to understand that Adam's sin is what we call a real imputation. There are judicial imputations where God, from his justice, does certain things because he wants to. And there's no affinity, no home in us, nothing that deserves it. But Adam's sin is what we call a real imputation because it has affinity with the old sin nature, which originated from Adam's original sin. So in other words, the imputation of being unrighteous has a place to go to mankind that came from Adam's original sin, which is the old sin nature. So when God imputed Adam's original sin, there was only one place for it to go, and that was to the old sin nature, not the soul, to the old sin nature which was passed down by the man. And therefore you have to understand, people say, well, did God create sin? Not at all. Was God the origin of sin? Not at all. We go back to the free will of mankind in a state of perfection. You see, the origin of sin is not God. The origin of sin is Adam's free will and Adam's self-determination. And never buy that garbage that he loved Eve, the woman, so much that he wanted to identify with her like Jesus Christ wants to identify with his church. There was, not, there was something in the woman that caused Adam to personally love her. There's nothing in the church that causes the Lord to personally love us unless we recognize it's his own righteousness that he's loving. And therefore, we see again the great genius of God. God's great uh, wisdom comes to the rescue when he gives us or imputes to us Adam's sin. doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like it's a blessing. Just like many times you go through adversities in life and they don't seem to be like a, a, a blessing, but they are. They're the things that make you stronger. Or you have certain individuals in your life who drive you crazy and bug you where you have to have impersonal, unconditional love. And if they are members of your family and they, if they are parents, for example, you have to respect them. If you're married to an unbeliever or a man who's got negative volition to a doctrine, you have to love him and respect him. And if you're married to a woman that has negative volition to a doctrine, you have to love her like Christ loved the church. No one can do that in the human realm. You can only do that with the power of God and, as I mentioned last night, learning the problem-solving devices. So when it comes to right man and right woman, it's not looking for the right man or looking for the right woman. It's you becoming the right man and she becomes the right woman. It's the person who has to have that self-determination that makes the decision. And that's how you become right for marriage, right, right for a relationship, by having doctrine resident in, that, in your soul. So God's great wisdom, again, comes to the rescue when he imputes to us Adam's sin so that we only have one testimony, and this is it. Not ever since I got born again and saved, I'm a much better person. 
because you weren't condemned because of your sins before salvation, nor are you condemned because of your sins after salvation. You see, the issue is not that you're a better person. You just recognize that you were giving a gift from God, and that gift is going to be much more powerful and much more effective than what Adam passed down to the human race. So when God imputes to us Adam's sin, the only, the only testimony we have is I am a sinner condemned at birth. Not I am a sinner because I committed adultery or I committed fornication or I lied or I cheated or I murdered. No, you are a sinner because of one man's sin. And that's the perfect wisdom of God. I am not condemned because of any sin I've ever committed. And now, not that I haven't committed a lot. Of course we have. But God did not take any of my personal sins and make me uh, pay for them. He did not take my personal sins and say, you're going to be judged for them. Because even divine discipline comes from his love to wake us up. Not to make us pay, pay, pay as a lot of Christians have said, especially in the past. So God saved something. He saved all of our personal sins. You see, a lot of people save stuff. They'll, some of you save, well, you try to save money. Some people are still saving stamps or baseball cards. Uh, some, I understand that there's a lot of women that save string, different colored string from different parts of the world. I have no idea why, but everybody has a hobby. God saved something too. Everyone's always saving something. God saved something too. He saved all of your sins and all of my sins for his son upon the cross. And he never did impute them to us. He imputed every single sin we would ever commit, all of them, to his son, Jesus Christ. So that the issue in salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ, not sin. The issue is the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think of Christ? Because every personal sin that I have ever committed and you have ever committed and the entire human race has ever committed was imputed to the Lord and judged. And that's, by the way, that's what caused him in Matthew 27, 46 to say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the death that paid the price, not his physical death. He paid that price by being separated from God. And because of that, we will never be forsaken by God. But the Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken on the cross because all of our sins were being poured out on him when he was still alive physically. So there's no place for arrogance. There's no place for you running around saying, I'm such a bad person. You have no idea what I'm like. God doesn't even think about that. He took care of that problem. There's no place for self-righteousness, no place for salvation by works, and definitely no place for guilt. And that's why Paul made this statement. Look at 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. Paul recognized that you and I can't get anywhere, no matter how good we are. We, you and I can't even get gifts from God or have God bless us because of our human goodness. He recognized grace. He recognized that God did it all, you see, so that none of us have a right or can run around and say, I'm the worst sinner that ever lived, though I would vote for several of you on any, any different occasion, but that's just my personal opinion, and I'm sure you'd probably have me in your top five or maybe even the top three, but the point is you can't do that. The greatest sinner who ever lived, according to God the Holy Spirit and according to the Scripture, according to the testimony of the Word of God, was a man called Saul of Tarsus, who later went on to become the Apostle Paul. And that's why he said in verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance. He said this under the power of the Holy Spirit. He said this is a trustworthy statement. It's deserving full acceptance, accept it, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. I'm the worst one of all. Now notice this. What did God do with the worst sinner that ever lived? Verse 16. And yet for this reason, because I was the worst sinner of all, I found mercy. Why? In order that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. If God can save the Apostle Paul, it follows off fortiori, God can save Pastor John Folly. If God can save the Apostle Paul, it follows off fortiori, God can save Evangelist Scott Grande. And God can even save me. 
You see, why? Because the worst one that ever lived was given to us as an example. If God can do that for him, God can do it for every member of the human race. So the greatest sin who ever lived, according to the scripture, was the apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus. Why? Because Paul had the principle. He knew God did all the work in condemnation. He knew, he knew that God does all the work in salvation. God did the work in the plan to condemn us. God does the work in salvation to save us. And Paul recognized this principle. Paul had the worst case of self-righteousness on record. He said in Philippians 3, when it comes to uh, following the law, I was the best. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. The worst sinner who ever lived was a man who was religious. The worst sinner, and by the way, we would look at him and say, now there goes a holy man. He's dedicating himself to God. And then we would look at some prostitute on the street or some bum on the corner and say, now that's a loser. Paul was the greatest sinner that ever lived. And that's why, according to the scriptures, he's the one that God used as an example. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees, as we have studied. Some even uh, teach, by the way, and think that he was the rich young ruler. He could have been. We know that he was alive when Jesus Christ wa walked the face of the earth. And that's why one of the parables the Lord gave, remember the one where he made a deal with some people, some guys, to work 12 hours, then some nine and others six? And then to one, he gave them the same power and the same, uh, the same money. He gave them the same that he made the deal with with the first group. Why? Because that could have represented the fact that there was going to come a man on the scene who was going to be the main apostle of the church age called the Apostle Paul who rejected Jesus Christ when he was alive. And even after that, he went about killing Christians and beating up uh, the parents in front of their children. And so some, uh, you, when you look at the Apostle Paul's life, it's very interesting if you go back and recognize all the things he accomplished in the human realm. He was almost so perfect that he was suffering from what we would call a terminal case of self-righteousness, and he was healed by the cross. He discovered that his self-righteousness could not get him anywhere, anywhere with God. Why? Because he wasn't condemned because of self. He was be condemned because of another man's sin. So he discovered that his self-righteousness could not get him anywhere with God or closer to heaven. But rather, it was doing the opposite. We look at people who are struggling and trying to get better and quit this habit and go to this convention or this retreat, and they're constantly trying to change themselves. You're looking at people who suffer from self-righteous arrogance. They think more highly of themselves. They think they have to change to be accepted by God. They're deceived by human viewpoint, which is opposite, of course, of divine viewpoint. So he was putting himself deeper and deeper in debt. A lot of religious people, good so-called people, go to church, they're involved, they might tithe, they might give their talent, their, their treasure, their, their uh, so-called spiritual gift, if they even are saved. By the way, most of them are not because you can be great morally and go to the lake of fire, not because of your sin, but because of another man's sin. And that's why God took care of them as well. But when you get involved with religion and self-righteousness and moral degeneracy, you may look good to the world, but you look terrible in the eyes of God. But he still loves you and he died for your sins. So therefore he believed, we know that on the road to Damascus, uh, Acts 9, he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ on that Damascus road. And at that moment, what happened to him? He received the imputation of eternal life that he was working for. By grace, in one second, he was on his way to kill Christians. He was on, on his way to torture them. Even the apostles were afraid of him. That's how much power he had. One second, he received what he worked for all of his life. Oh, how we struggle, don't we, to try to get things in life the way we think we're going to get them. And by the way, where did you get those thoughts from? You got them from the cosmic system. You got them from human viewpoint. You got them from the devil's world. It's not going to work out like that whatsoever. That's why you young people take advantage of us older folks. We went through the same thing you went through. Don't do what we did. Do what we say. Like the Pharisees, uh, the Lord told you know the story where He said, "Listen to the Pharisees. Uh, don't do, don't live like they live, but do or learn what they're saying because they've given you the truth, even though they lived uh, contrary to it." 
So he believed he received that eternal life and the imputation of divine righteousness through no works of his own, struggling for years, perhaps even decades, to try to please God and try to make himself a better person. And now that is what exactly made him the worst sinner that ever lived. Interesting, the worst sinner that ever lived was a Jewish person who was a religious person, a religious individual. He was so self-righteous. And the greatest individual that ever lived was also a Jew. He was grace-oriented and he came to save the human race. That's why I said be careful that this nation doesn't go anti-Jew, anti-Semitic, because it will be destroyed. So, you know, a lot of individuals are in so much bondage today because they simply don't know what these principles are all about. And I want you to go back to the book of Proverbs. No, go back to Romans 9, for example, for a minute. A lot of this stuff is so exciting to me. Got a lot of good stuff that I want to save to Sunday. I can never do it. I just got to get it out right away. If Paul was here, he would stand up and, to, and uh, he'd stand up next to some, some individual and he would say, you know what, I'm the worst sinner who ever lived. And immediately they would think of the fact that he must be gay or he must, he must be, uh, he must be uh, an adulterer or he must be a thief. No, he was a religious, self-righteous person. The thing that made him such a terrible sinner was that he was religious and self-righteous. See, man's ways are not God's ways, and God's thoughts are beyond man's thoughts. That's why we have to see it from divine viewpoint, and that's why you have to receive it every day. Because every day your mind is being programmed by the internet, by the news, by the media, by the things that you're reading, by the people that you have to work with. I mean, the more I go out into the cosmic system, I'm not in the cosmic system, but, you know, having to go out to work or having to go out to dinner or somewhere, the more I have a lot of compassion for those of you who have to work in that place. See, right here, I just work in a place surrounded by Deacon Jim Mello, uh, George and uh, Rachel, and sometimes other individuals as well. So we're not used to all the gossip that you have to put up with all of the maligning, all the judging, all the complaining, all the criticism. We're not used to that. Now and then, George does have one of those days that he challenges our problem-solving devices intake, but it works, and he's caused us to both, me and Rachel, to grow stronger. So we thank him for that. But the point is that here's a man who was a religious person, and he not only was a religious person, he also knew something else. He was a mean religious person. He had a mean evil streak. He was mean and he practiced evil. And the form of evil that he practiced was the worst sin of all. Think of it. What right did he have to go along and go, go his way and kill other Christians? kill other people. He was a murderer. He went around murdering Christians, and of course, people have still, still do that today. Some of you do it when you judge them with your tongue, and you don't love them because you're a murderer if you do that. But Paul was the worst. Just like Paul was the best at whatever he did, he was the best at being the worst sinner that ever lived. He just went around, as I mentioned, and he went around and killed Christians in the name of God, in the name of Judaism. But once he believed in Christ and became a Christian himself, he said, first thing I have to do is I have to get a recognition. I have to take a test with myself. I was a wicked person. I thought I was good. And that's why God took him in the desert for around three to four years, and the Lord Jesus Christ had to train him there. He had to get him away from religion, from Judaism, from self-righteousness, and from the Pharisees. And so the worst sinner who ever lived again was the Apostle Paul. Theologically, however, we would say the worst sinner who ever lived has to be Adam. He was given everything that mankind could ask for, and he's the one that's responsible for passing down the sin nature. But we should love Adam, shouldn't we? Because Adam qualified us for a savior. Adam's sin condemned the entire, the, he was the head of the human race. He qualified us to need the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, what was his first sin? He took the forbidden fruit from the hand of the woman and ate it. Always find that interesting. Why didn't he get the fruit himself? He didn't take it off the tree. We might classify him as the first leech. Uh, I'll have it, but you're going to have to get it for me, you see. He was too lazy to go over and take it for himself. He didn't take it off the tree. He took it from the hand of the woman. And by the way, it was a beautiful hand because God created it. And ever since then, ladies, he's a real gem of wisdom. 
He took it from the hand of the woman. And ever since then, mankind has been taking things from the hand of the woman all of their lives. Learn that. That's why when you look at a man or woman of God, or you're looking to get involved in a relationship, and you're, I'm even talking dating, make sure there's doctrine resident in the soul because the average member of the human race is under the evil of being self-righteous. So the principle is a very simple one. One man's sin condemned us, and again, the other man's righteousness saves us. It's not that that imputation, by the way, of, of uh, Adam's sin. What did it do? It set us up for a potential. The imputation of sin sets, a, sets us up for the potentiality for salvation. Now I need a savior. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow the way humans think. We always think that if things happen good, God's blessing. When things could be happening with adversity or wrong. And God is really blessing, making you stronger. So there's no potential for us to need a savior unless we are condemned. And of course, you know the, the reason why we are condemned. One man's sin, and now you should recognize the reason why you are saved. One man's righteousness. Which means, if you're going to witness with your lips, you better have this principle right down. Because no one's going to the eternal lake of fire. No one's going to be separated from God because of their sins. That's been taken care of. So in Romans chapter 9, the reason why the Apostle Paul tells us the tragedy of the Jew is, and, uh, is to tell us, to warn us, and uh, how the Jew fell. Abraham fell, Isaac fell, Jacob fell. But what made, them, uh, what made them qualified for blessing? They recognized the fact that one man's sin condemned them, and they all three of them believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, when we see it, it's going to set up a contrast. You know, we're always looking at people that come from the same family or people that have the same blessings, the same environment, and we learn that it doesn't matter what your environment is. One individual goes forward, becomes a winner, the other one becomes a loser. And so the, what Paul did is he set up a contrast, that he set up the, the contrast that, a, that set Abraham up with, uh, in contrast to his brother Nahor. Same house, same environment, setting Isaac up in contrast to Ishmael and Jacob up in contrast to Esau. God had everything under control. So this is all the background. Look at verses 6 and 7. This is the reason why Paul is saying these things. You have to dig these things out. When he says this rejection is not to imply as though the word of God has failed because they are not all Israel just simply because they're Abraham's kids or Isaac, Isaac's kids or Jacob's. They are not all Israel who are descended, who have been born from Israel or from a Jew. Neither are they all children. Now what does that mean? We'll see that before we close this evening. When it says, neither are they all children, of course they're all children, but he's talking about children that receive the inheritance, children that receive the promises, children that receive what God has designed for them to inherit because of their relationship with someone who was a winner believer and because of the fact that they became winner believers and they went forward and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have to understand that when it says children, it means that they are not children of the inheritance. And uh, by the way, that's why people can come from the same family. Others will be blessed and graced out, and others will be under condemnation, and they'll be under guilt, and they'll be losers in life. Oh, they may appear to be winners because they have a lot of stuff. That's what people think. When the Lord Jesus Christ taught, it's the poor who are really rich, and it's the rich that are really poor. And what, what we're seeing over and over again for the past three or four months is how we have to change our thinking and change our viewpoint because we are being deceived. Like I said last evening, we are filled with a nation of people right now who are suckers for any lies. We have manipulation all over the place, especially from the media with their liberal uh, uh, viewpoint. So the heritage that counts, the heritage that Paul is saying that counts in this chapter is not from physical birth. It's not from the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The uh, Arabs claim to be related to Abraham. They're right. He was a Jew for not, he was an Arab for 99 years. That's why we have the problem in the Middle East. The Arabs are saying, well, we have Abraham as our father. Yes, that's their physical birth. And the Jews are saying, no, we have Abraham as our father, but that's the one that counts. You see, the heritage that counts is not from physical birth. 
It's not, it's not from the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but of course from the spiritual birth or regeneration, being born again. And that is the heritage principle that Paul is bringing out. So it's not the first birth that counts, of course, we know that. It's the second birth, regeneration, that counts. Now this brings us to the premise illustrated in the formation of the Jewish race uh, and the nation that Paul is going to bring out in verses uh, 7 through 18. Each sentence, each verse will become more and more difficult as we go forward. But if you concentrate, you're going to learn something fantastic. In fact, when we get to Romans 9.22 you have probably one of the most difficult verses in the Bible for a pastor to teach. But we're working up to that. By the time that we get there, maybe two years from now, who knows, but by the time we get there, I guarantee you many of you are going to be qualified to understand it because you're going to grow because of your positive volition. So in Romans 9, 7, let's begin or begin to close here. He says, neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. Now, we don't have to exegete each word here. I've already done that, by the way. Uh, we don't have to understand each word. It's correctly translated. For example, the first one that we have to study, however, is neither are they all children. That word children is the predicate nominative plural of technon, which is techna. Looks like this in the Greek, T-E-K-N-A. What does it mean? Children? No. It means believers in Christ. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. This is what Paul is talking about in this chapter. So children means believers in Christ, used here for children, as I mentioned, in the sense of inheritance. In other words, the racial Jew uh, is not the true Jew. The racial Jew is not the true Jew. He's not going to be the children of inheritance. And what's going on in the Middle East right now? The Arabs are all fighting for their land. And what's happening? Jew, the Jews are fighting for theirs. And who's right? The Jews are, but the Arabs have a case. And by the way, one of Abraham's sons owned a piece of land, and it's where Mecca is right now. The same place that Mecca is, where all the Arabs bow down and worship their God, Allah. So this principle of Romans 9 goes way back. Think about it. We're learning something that was written about 2,000 years ago, and we know more than the media right now. We didn't go to an Ivy League uh, school or university to come out with this knowledge. We're smart because we are dumb. And God chooses the dumb to confound the wise. He chooses the fools to confound the wise. He chooses the simple things. And it's the simple things in life that we've missed that we're not going to, I'm not going to try to miss those anymore. But those are the things that make us wise not actually going to a place of education that's filled with human viewpoint and then getting in bondage because it cost you 50 or 60 grand to do so. I'll do it for half the price if you come here. <laughs> so neither are they all children because they are Abraham's children. Again, what does it mean? First of all, as I mentioned in opening, I said this on purpose, Abraham, had, he had eight sons altogether. Number one son, Ishmael. What was the rule in the Old Testament? The firstborn gets the inheritance. But it's the firstborn for the Jews in the sense that those who are born again. And so the first son he had was Ishmael, who was born from an Arab, as you know, Hagar. Number two is Isaac. So you have Ishmael, you have Isaac. And then you have six more, by the way. And I looked up all these six. They have, we have three different mothers. You have uh, Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl. By the way, she was an Egyptian, representing the world, etc. You have Sarah. She was the Sumero-Akkadian princess. She was a princess. She became a Jew when Abraham did. And then you have Keturah, a little Arab that Abraham spent the rest of his life with. And she, she gave him six children, so they had a lot of fun after age 100. So there's still hope for you, Mr. Johnson, Bill. That answers your, that answers your question you had this morning. He goes, when is this feeling of sex ever going to stop? He says, I'm, I'm more wild than ever before. <laughs> so, of course, I said, well, you can go over 100 and all that, but you might need a second and third wife. You try to find a second one, you'll never find the right one like the one you got now. Because the right one is not her. She does not exist. The right one is the right man. The right one is the right woman. And by the way, you folks are a manifestation of how doctrine can heal and bless a marriage. You're a witness to us. And to everyone in this church that knows you, a fine couple. Why? Doctrine in their soul for decades. That's what made them a fine couple. 
So Abraham certainly had a little bit of everything. I mean, he had three wives, an Egyptian wife. He had, I didn't mean to say it like that. He had, he had a Semitic uh, princess, and then he spent the rest of his, his life with a little Arab girl. And that's why, go back to Genesis uh, 25 too. I'll give you the son's names. Hurry up, I have five minutes. I'm not going to get to one major point I wanted to get to. Just think of it, Abraham had six sons, right? And they all remained Arabs instead of individuals who had become born again. Because if they had believed in Jesus Christ, Abraham would have also given them, he would have given them part of the inheritance as well. But notice what it says in Genesis 25 too. It's talking about, the, uh, it's talking about Keturah. She brought to him Zimran and uh, Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shuar. And by now you know exactly what their names are, big deal, right? No, there is a big deal because if your pastor looks it up like I did, you'll find out these individuals went on to be prominent religious leaders worshiping the, the moon god, who by the way represents Allah in our day and age. Eight sons, they came from three different mothers. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Just because Sarah seems to have been the better woman because she was the doctrinal woman and uh, she, was, she seemed to be the one that was right for Abraham at that time, that doesn't mean that because she was so good, God blessed Isaac. And because Abraham was so good that God blessed uh, Isaac. Abraham was the father of eight sons. And that simply means that individuals can be born with the same parent by the same parents, in the same environment, and it's not the parents' fault how they turn out. It's their own fault because they have to make a free will decision and have their own self-determination. And just because Sarah seemed to be a little a better woman because she did make God's Hall of Fame in uh, Hebrews 11.6, uh, there was also these other two ladies, but the sons did not turn out like uh, Sarah's son did because the sons did not make the decision like Sarah's son. The issue again, and see this falls back in application, the issue again is you cannot blame your parents or environment for how you turn out. You cannot say just because a person is the uh, son or daughter of a winner believer that they're Christians. They will have to prove that they're Christians by their own lifestyle and their own testimony with the witness of their lips and the witness of their life. So it isn't because Abraham loved Sarah more than others. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It has to do with the fact that individuals turn out the way that they do because of one reason. No one's parents can uh, actually do anything. No one's parents has anything to do with their failures in life. No one. In fact, I've got two minutes, so let's go there quickly to Ezekiel chapter 18. This is a good place to stop. It doesn't mean that parents cannot have an influence, but you can have all the influence in the world. Ultimately, you cannot blame yourself for how they turn out. In verse 20, notice what it says. Chapter 18, verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. In other words, the, so the children do not share the guilt of the parent. Now notice next, nor will the father or the parent bear the punishment for the son's iniquity, how they turn out. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon themselves, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself as well. What is that saying? It's saying this. It's saying that no one can ever blame their parents. And by the way, moms and dads, don't ever let it happen. Because God chose you to be their mom and their dad. And he made a perfect decision. He's the one that imputed that soul to that body. And he's the one who chose your parents. And you might say, well, they were losers, or one of them was, or they might have been winners. That doesn't make any difference at all. You have to go back to the way God has designed things. God has designed your life, your environment, your parents, the time that you live in, your gender, the geographical location, he's designed it because it's the best thing you need to grow closer to him. Way back to the first mentioned principle, the best thing they needed is to be married. And that caused them to be clothed by God and have a, a closer relationship with him. So the application is we have to re realize that there's no place for complaining because God's the one who has brought these individuals in your life. God is the one who said she will be your mother and he will be your father. 
And God did that because that's the exact mother and exact father, the perfect mother and father for you to need God, for you to grow and become a winner. And you can never blame your parents for your sins, nor can the parents blame the, uh, blame the children for theirs. You have to go back to the principle, we will all stand before God and give an account for ourselves. And some of the greatest friends we have in life are our enemies. Some of the greatest friends we have in our life are the ones who judge us and criticize us, lie about us, they gossip about us. Why? It drives us to have to need the Lord Jesus Christ or become a member of the world system. Being a loser in the eyes of God when he has given you all the power and resources to be a winner. Father, thank you once again for your word this evening. We are grateful for those who are here who constantly grow in your grace and knowledge. We pray that grace will be applied to all of us, that we will take the responsibility for our own decisions, and that we are grateful that you've given us this opportunity to have more insight into the word of God. Challenge us with what we've heard this evening. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen.